I chose this seated attendant figure from the Swat Valley because Swat Valley is a very interesting region at the crossroads of East and West, especially during the ancient Gandharan period. And what I really liked about this figure is that you see features of both East and West in the figure's face. And there are some particularities of the Swat Valley style that you can see in this figure, like the lotus petals that he sits on. Besides that, even though the figure is very small, it's quite beautiful and delicate, especially in the use of silver in the figure's face and embellishing him. Well, this Avalokitesh rise reminding me of my studies in India. Actually, I'm, I'm basically Indologist, and this piece has a lot of Indian characteristics, and maybe it is even Indian and adapted in Tibet. So it's Avalokitesh, although the owner originally thought it was a bodhisattva. And if you look at the crown, there are two big jewels in it, but behind one of these jewels there's a little statue of Amitabha, which means that it is indeed Avalokiteshvara, iconographically. It's very close to 11th century Pala sculptures in uh, eastern India, and it's definitely based on that, if it's not Pala. But it's definitely also adapted in Tibet. It's a silver statue, and it has these big gems on it. And maybe for our aesthetical feeling, it's not really what it should be because they're a bit oversized but for the Tibetans it's really adding to the richness of this statue and apart from the silver there's also this gilt uh, copper base in a lotus shape around lotus shape so the whole thing really looks extremely rich and, and powerful because it has this Indian kind of stature it's beautifully standing the hold is in Abhaya Mudra, it's the hand that shows uh, have no fear, the right hand, and the left hand holds the stem of a lotus. Uh, the lotus is broken at the shoulder, but it definitely was there. And the figure is wearing a skin of an antelope, which is partly maybe kind of dress of another Buddhist deity, but in this case it's definitely Avalokiteshvara. So altogether it's, it's an intriguing, a strong, a well-decorated, typically Tibetan sculpture with affinities going back to eastern India, and that's why I chose this one. I chose these two portraits of Tara because each of them individually is very beautiful, and you can see very delicate, fine features like individual toes in each of their feet. And I thought that was quite sweet, especially with the way the one on the left is displayed so that it's hanging over the pedestal. Besides that, I really liked the placement of these two figures together because it illustrates some of the differences between the Eastern Indian style and the Tibetan style from roughly the same periods in this representation of Tara. And you can see that especially, for example, in the use of copper alloy in the Tibetan Tara's leg, which is very different than the technique used on the Indian Tara's leg. And in looking at them together, you can really see the difference in the origins of both of these figures, even though it was originally thought, in fact, that the Tibetan Tara could have been from Eastern India. This is a very personal choice. It's related to my own research on the Western Himalayas and also to my liking of blue and dark blue. What is depicted is a deity that is very important for early Tibetan Buddhism. It's one of the major wrathful deities of early Tibetan Buddhism called Trilokya Vijaya, the conqueror of the three worlds, which has three arms and six heads. And has kind of the main arms crossed in front of the breast in a gesture that is called Vajra Humkara, for which the same exhibit actually shows some other deities of that same gesture. What's very nice about this one and extremely unusual is that it's carved of stone and not only of any stone, but of lapis lazuli stone. So it's an entirely kind of blue object and you see the stone in, in its slight faults, but it's actually a big piece of lapis lazuli that has been carved into that image. And stylistically, it's rather, the carving is not the finest, but stylistically, it's very clearly related to Western Himalayan paintings that show the same iconography in that region, where that deity is one of the major deities in mandalas represented in monasteries that I studied the early period of my career. I chose this piece as it encapsulates what is strongest about the Ningje Lam collection, miniature masterfully cast and beautifully ornamented sculptures. 
a tiny jewel. It's the perfect size to fit into a gao, or amulet box, an example of which can be found on the third floor Masterworks exhibition. Even at this minute scale, recognizable decorative patterns such as the Seven Jewels of the Monarch, like the King and Queen's earrings, can be seen worked into the patterns on the cushions he sits on, and you'll see these as intertwined circles and triangles. If you look around to the back of the figure, you'll see on these same cushions a tiny inscription identifying this figure as one of the most important figures in Tibetan history, the fifth Dalai Lama. The fifth Dalai Lama was not only a significant religious and political leader, but also one of the most celebrated patrons of the arts in Tibet. The Great Fifth, as the fifth Dalai Lama came to be known, took a keen personal interest in artistic production, organizing large numbers of artists for the many construction projects of his Gelukpa monastic order, such as the famous Potala Palace, begun in 1645. The mid-17th century is often described as a second golden age of Tibetan culture, with the unification of Tibet for the first time in many centuries under the Great Fifth, giving his school both religious and political supremacy in Tibet. This is a depiction of Vajrapani, but an extremely rare and curious one. So I chose it because it's, it is so unusual and puzzling, and actually we don't really know what this form is about. It relates, like in the same case you have to the right of it, to other forms of Vajrapani, which are much more conventional. They all are, can be recognized by the, the Vajra in the hand, in the raised hand. But this one is very unusual in its kind of secondary element. On the halo you have a representation of a sun disk and a moon crescent, which is usually a sign for endurance or all time and for kind of higher forms of deities that encompass all time. And even more curious, attached either to the halo or to the lower arm are two skulls, which is completely unusual and unusual is also that he actually doesn't stand on his lotus but he stands on the vehicle which is a double vehicle the lion and an elephant and he stands on them and the lion is actually kind of a, a later version of the lions from the imperial period as they were found on the imperial graves so it's an indication that this is a very early representation of Vajrapani and a very unusual representation of Vajrapani, probably even unique so far as I can tell. Well, the reason I chose this specific sculpture is because it's very alive. It has a face that really reminded me of someone I actually knew, a person, a very kind and amazing Tibetan teacher with whom I had personal studies and experience and interaction and he looked basically just like this sculpture. He had the same eyes, you know, with drooping eyelids, you know, big nose and this kind of same smile and the same type of body, you know, not very tall, a little bit round and happy looking. I thought that this sculpture was just amazingly accurate in how it depicted the character of the person and, and this famous translator Golotzawa, his name is Shonupel, who is inscribed on the base of this sculpture, was also one of the leading scholars and translators of his time. And he is mostly known for the historical treatise that he composed called The Blue Annals. But for me, the sculpture is, has just different kind of personal appeal, apart from it representing this famous historical figure. This would have been only possible for someone who is very mastered in the skill of metal casting. And to express this kind of fluency in, in, in familiarity with the face of the person who must have been either just recently deceased for, for the sculptor to make this impression, very lively and kind of true to life almost. So I would think that this sculpture is probably made sometime in the late 15th century rather than in 16th century. But again, this is just my opinion. Virupa has always been one of my favorite ones, and I had it in previous exhibitions in, in Belgium. Actually, I'm coming from Belgium, and this guy, uh, I should say in, in these terms, looks a bit like, please give all the others an extra beer. That's why he lifts his hand, you know. And that's why he was so famous in Belgium, too. 
Actually, the story comes very close to this. Virupa, which means the wicked one or the, the ugly one, he was one of these Mahasiddhas, these great mysterious saints that was roaming around I think in the 9th, 10th century already. Uh, well, he became legendary, but uh, he's, he's very popular. And he became also the abbot of one of the most famous monasteries in Nalanda in Bihar, in eastern India. And he became a bit disoriented in the sense that one saw that they brought meat and beer to, to his room, although he was an abbot, and he always said it's for the offering to the gods. But then they also saw that the pigeons in the monastery landed up on this platter, so it became a bit weird, and they were suspicious about it. And in the end, they, they threw him out of the monastery, and he went wandering around, and he decorated himself with flowers, like the hippies did uh, 30 years ago. And he landed up in bars and places where you wouldn't expect a, a monk to go. And um, th there's one occasion where he was... Uh, drinking well and at a certain moment the bartender thought it was enough and he should pay but of course as a, as a wandering monk he didn't have any money so he said let us make an agreement I will draw a line on the floor and when the shadow of the sun passes this line I will pay then he lifted his hand to the sun and that's the movement one sees in the statue and he holds the sun and the sun doesn't move anymore so he kept on drinking for three days and everything became so hot in the country that finally the king came to the bar and begged Virupa to stop with this kind of spell and he finally did and then the king paid for all the drinks and so he got well off. Well I chose this specific sculpture of Nairatnya because it's just really lively and very interesting. It represents one of these examples where Tibetan art reflects Nepalese aesthetics and craftsmanship of new wars. At the same time, it also reflects these cultural preferences that the Tibetan patrons and donors had, for example, asking to have these inlaid turquoise decorations on the sculpture. As we know that the blue Turquoise is one of the choice stones for the Tibetans. They like it a lot, and it has very you know, deep symbolic meaning, apart from being a very attractive stone. But then also the sculpture, even though it's very small, it's extremely detailed and very exquisitely crafted. You can see it all around in 360 degrees, and it's beautifully done in the back as well. And it's supposed to represent this a concert of tantric deity, Hevadra. It's made of different pieces of metal that were cast separately and then assembled together. But what's the most interesting about the sculpture is not how it was made, even though it is, again, very skillful casting and then assemblage and decoration in the end. But for me, it's most interesting how it is finished. See, the face is painted with gold and then the face and the hair also painted red, so she is actually a redhead. In a way, it, it, it does reflect her, I guess, nature, because she's supposed to be not entirely wrathful, but kind of semi-wrathful, but you, we, you could see that she has fangs that kind of reflect that, that nature, and even her eye, kind of bushy eyebrows are painted red as well, and I think it's just this degree of finish that the sculpture represents is really remarkable. I chose this piece because it is a beautiful example of Tibetan portrait sculpture in silver and exemplary of an important sculptural style in Tibet. An inscription on the back identifies him as the 8th Karmapa Mikyo Dorje. He can be recognized as a Karmapa by his black hat, his badge of his office. The 8th Karmapa was said to be influential in the founding of the artistic tradition of his religious school known as the encampment style. While he is recorded to have written a treatise on iconometric proportions for depicting deities, Little is known of his actual role in the founding of this artistic tradition, and neither painting nor sculpting is ever mentioned in his biographies. This sculpture also resembles others from this same tradition, including one inscribed silver sculpture also in a private collection dated to 1598, which helps to contextualize this work within the tradition and help characterize the sculptural style. One distinctive feature of the style of the Karmapa's court is exemplified here, an intense interest in the patterning of concentric angular lines in the thick layers of the robes, which gives a sense of weight and plasticity. 
This is a sculptural style which was founded by Karma Sigil, who was considered to be a spiritual emanation of the eighth Karmapa depicted here, continuing his activities in the realm of religious sculpture. <laughs> 